Chapter 2, The U.S. System of Constitutional Government. Okay, so in this lecture, I'm going to talk about how our Constitution is set up, what it's supposed to do, what it allows the government to do, what it, what it doesn't allow the government to do, and how it's evolved over time. Okay, so let's start off with a very basic question. What is a Constitution? So according to your textbook, a constitution is a governing document that sets forth the country's basic rules of government and politics. So in other words, our constitution is sort of an operations manual for the government. It tells us uh, how the government's supposed to work and what authority the government has. So... Our U.S. Constitution serves three purposes. It establishes the basic framework of the U.S. government, so it's that manual for the government. It limits the power of government, which is a very important uh, idea that we don't want government to be able to do uh, anything. There are certain things that the government cannot do. That's what makes us a democracy. That w that's what makes us uh, a free country. And uh, towards that end, the third thing it does is it protects people's rights. So uh, that goes along with the idea of limiting the power of government because we don't want the government to have too much power. Uh, and, the, and, the, and the most important thing we don't want the government to do is to take our way, our freedoms. And so our Constitution protects our freedoms by spelling out very clearly what sort of rights we have. Uh, for example, freedom of the press, freedom of uh, assembly and protest, freedom of religion, uh, the right to a trial by jury if we are accused of a crime, and, 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 and all the other rights that are listed in the Bill of Rights, the first ten amendments. Okay, so those are the three things that our Constitution does. Now, the Founding Fathers' desire for a constitution that sets limits on government power dates back to the experience of the 13 American colonies under British rule. So before uh, the United States of America was an independent country, the original 13 states were part of the British Empire, were controlled by Great Britain. And, uh, and, th and that... Uh, you know, that goes back to the early 1600s and the founding of Virginia, the first colony. In 1776, the 13 uh, colonies declared themselves independent from the British Empire when they uh, announced the Declaration of Independence. The reason they did that is because by that point they felt that they had their their freedom had been abused by the British government by the King of Britain George III, and there were a lot of reasons why they felt that way. But for the most part, it was about taxation. Uh, they uh, were being taxed uh, more and more lead in the years leading up to the American Revolution, and they felt that the this taxation by the British was illegal and oppressive because they had not agreed to it. They felt that uh, the British government uh, had to consult with them under the rules of the British Constitution, uh, but that didn't happen. And so they felt that uh, this uh, failure to consult them and failure to pass laws that they did not agree to uh, was uh, oppressive. And, uh, and, and, and the particular issue of taxation uh, led to the famous uh, saying that I'm sure you've probably all heard, uh, no taxation without representation. You cannot tax us without uh, our representation in the government, uh, our uh, opinion being uh, heard. And so because they felt that the government had violated its constitution and its ob political obligations to them, they felt they had no choice but to rebel and then ultimately declare their independence. 
So uh, when when they created the United States and when they created the first uh, government and then the first constitution, the American states felt that the most important thing they wanted the government, to, the Constitution to do was to prevent the United States uh, government, the, the national government, from ever being able to oppress them uh, the same way that the British government had oppressed the colonies. And so they created a Constitution that set clear limits on what the government could not do and what the government could do. Now, this constitution that we currently live under today is actually the second governing document the U.S. has had. Uh, before the constitution, uh, there was another uh, first uh, government that the U.S. had uh, lived under briefly. That first government was called the, uh, the American Confederation, and it was created by a constitution uh, governing document called the Articles of Confederation. And the Articles uh, formed America's first government that lasted from 1781 to 1788, and it was created a couple years before the end of the American Revolution. The, the American Revolution ended in 1783, but before uh, the American Revolution ended, the 13 states uh, decided that they needed to create some form of national government uh, to be more unified and to be stronger. They felt that the idea of remaining 13 independent states uh, loosely connected to each other, uh, each with independent state governments and state constitutions, was not going to be a good enough way to survive uh, in in a post-revolution uh, uh, period. And so they wanted to create a national government, and so they created this Articles of Confederation, which created the type of national government that we call a confederation. And so a confederation is a system of government where you have a national government made up of independent units, in this case the states, each with their own state governments. And under the uh, system of confederation, the power of, most of the power of the government rests in the states, not in the national government, but in the state government. So under, this, under the article of the confederation, the state governments were much more powerful than the national government. And so that government they created, uh, the Article of Confederation, lasted from 1781 to 1788. Uh, you can probably tell that because it only lasted for close to eight years, it was not a very good system of government. Uh, there are uh, several problems that emerged above, uh, under the Article of Confederation uh, but basically, the two biggest problems were this. First of all, the Articles of Confederation did not create a chief executive, uh, a, a, a national chief executive. So there was no one person who was in charge of the national government. There was no president, uh, no one president. And the reason uh, they didn't create a presidency was because they were worried that if they created a strong chief executive of a national government, that person could too easily become a, like a king and uh, therefore uh, use his power to oppress uh, the states and the people. So they that that's what they had just gotten away from uh, when they broke away from the British government. They didn't want any possibility of getting back into that kind of a situation again, so they created a government without a chief executive. The problem without creating of not creating a chief executive was that there was no one person to be in charge. There was no one person to guide the government. There was no one person to make a final decision, so... 
uh, the uh, national government under the Oracle Confederation was very, very weak because there was no chief executive. The second problem had to do with Congress. Congress uh, did not have the power to tax. State legislatures, state governments could tax their citizens, but the national government, the national Congress, could not tax its citizens. It could ask for voluntary donations, but it could not require them. And so that really didn't work. Uh, imagine that today. If instead of having to pay taxes, you were given the option of saying, no, I'd really rather not pay my taxes. Well, how many people do you think would really say, yeah, I really want to pay taxes? Uh, not many. So one of the problems uh, that the national government had was it didn't have any money. It, and it had no funding, and, and so it really couldn't do anything. It was too much uh, under the control of state governments who had the money, uh, and so the national government really couldn't do anything, and, and there was a lot of chaos. And so the Article of Confederation really did not work well. And so in the summer of 1787, the states decided that they needed to rethink the Article, Articles of Confederation, and they decided that they needed to make the national government stronger. And so they decided to have a convention, a meeting, in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, which at the time was the capital of the United States. And the purpose of the convention was to try to revise the Articles of Confederation in order to make the national government stronger and more powerful and more workable. So in the summer of 1787, uh, representatives from all the 13 states uh, got together and they met to talk about revising the Articles of Confederation. Didn't take very long before they decided that the idea of revising the Articles of Confederation uh, was not a, a good way to proceed. That instead, what they decided was that the Articles of Confederation uh, needed to be abolished uh, completely and replaced with a new government. So uh, the 13 states ended up working throughout the summer of 1787 in Philadelphia and they came up with a new government a US constitution the constitution that we have today and that constitution created a much stronger national government than existed under the Articles of Confederation. In fact, uh, instead of being a confederation, the new government created by the U.S. Constitution was just the opposite, uh, a type of government called a federation. And the federation uh, gave more power to the national government than to the state governments. Okay, so uh, instead of having a system of government where states were in control and a national government was weak, the U.S. Constitution created just the opposite. The national government was very strong and the state uh, governments were still strong. They still had power, but not nearly as much power as the... Uh, national government. Okay. So the U.S. Constitution was written in Philadelphia in 1787 and ratified in 1788. 
Okay, so uh, ratified meaning accepted, approved by the states. So in order for the Constitution to become official and to officially replace the Articles of Confederation, it had to be ratified and accepted by three quarters of the states, nine of the 13 states, uh, and that took a while. It took uh, a little over a year before that happened, and ultimately all 13 states uh, accepted the Constitution uh, by 1788, and then in 1789, uh, the country had its first presidential election, and that's when George Washington became the first president of the United States. So, uh, creating that Constitution was not an easy task. Uh, the 13, uh, the leaders of the 13 states uh, had a lot of disagreements and, and argued about a lot of different things uh, throughout that summer of 1787. And ultimately, the U.S. Constitution is a product of compromises. That's what often happens when uh, two or more groups of people have to come up with an agreement on something and they go in with uh, points of argument. They try to find... Uh, where they agree, and they end up compromising. And so that's how the Constitution was created. Two of the biggest compromises that led to the creation of the Constitution that we now have were the Great Compromise and Three-Fifths Compromise. The Great Compromise was a compromise between two competing plans called the Virginia Plan, which was uh, put forth by the state of Virginia, and the New Jersey Plan, which was put forth by the state of New Jersey. Uh, Virginia, at the time, was one of the biggest states in the uh, country. In fact, it was the biggest, most populated state in the country. Uh, and New Jersey was one of the smaller states, so one of the biggest disagreements uh, between uh, the states uh, during the Constitutional Convention of 1787 was uh, disagreements between the small states and the big states, uh, also between northern and southern states, which is the case of Virginia, a southern state, and New Jersey, a northern state, and uh, states like Virginia that were based on, that whose economy was based on agriculture, and states like New Jersey, where the economy was based on on, uh, on business and commerce, that was another big disagreement. And, and uh, states that uh, were agricultural states had different interests than states like New Jersey, where uh, the economy was based on, on commerce. And another big difference between the states that was represented by the difference between Virginia and New Jersey uh, was uh, concerned with the issue of slavery. Uh, 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 slavery was still legal throughout the United States at the time, but slavery by that point was much uh, more heavily uh, situated in the South. The South was much, much more dependent on slavery than the North for its economy. So Virginia was a slave state that wanted to protect the interest of of slavery and the role of slavery to the economy of the United States and the South. And uh, states like New Jersey had different, uh, different ideas be and different interests because slavery was becoming less important in the North in a state like New Jersey. So the Great Compromise was a compromise between the Virginia Plan and the New Jersey Plan, which who which were very different had very different ideas, uh, particularly about the structure of the national legislature, the structure of Congress, what Congress should look like. Okay. So uh, Virginia put forth a proposal to have the Congress uh, representation in Congress based on population so that every state in the country would have a different number of representatives in the Congress uh, 
and that and the number of representatives would be, would be uh, decided based on the population of a state. So the more people who lived in the state, the more representatives that state would have in Congress. So Virginia liked that idea because as a big state, Virginia would have more representation in Congress than a state like New Jersey or a state like uh, Maine or a state like uh, uh, Vermont or Delaware, which were much smaller states. Uh, New Jersey, as a smaller state, didn't like that because the small states represented by New Jersey said, if we do that, if we have a Congress that's based on population and the big states have more representation, then small states like ours will be dominated by the big states. The big states will be in control of Congress. They'll decide what laws get passed, and our interests will be uh, neglected, and we won't be equal. Our freedom will be taken away from us because we'll be at the mercy of big states who will tell us what to do uh, who, what we can do, what we can't do. So New Jersey said a far more uh, fair plan would be to have equal representation among all states. So every state will have one representative or two representatives or three, whatever it is, but each state will have an equal number of representatives. The big states... Virginia in particular said, well, we don't like that idea because that's, that's not fair. Uh, we have more people, we'll be paying more taxes, and so we need more representation to adequately represent the interests of our people because we're bigger states. And so uh, New Jersey and Virginia, big states and, and little states uh, disagreed uh, about this plan and so what they decided to do was to split the difference and create a Congress that uh, represented both of these plans. So the great compromise between the New, New Jersey and Virginia plans decided to create a bicameral legislature a legislature that has two houses, the, U the U.S. House of Representatives and the U.S. Senate. And the U.S. House of Representatives would be uh, a house where representation would be based on population so that bigger states would have more representatives than smaller states. But the Senate would be based on equal representation so that every state would have the same number of representatives, no matter how big they were or no matter how small they were. And that's the way we do it today. So the House has uh, a different number of representatives uh, per state based on population. So New York, for example, has... Uh, more represent more representatives in New Hampshire because New York State is a more populous state than New Hampshire. But in the Senate, both New Hampshire and New York have two senators each because the Senate is based on equal representation. So it doesn't matter how big or small a state is, each state has two representatives. So that great compromise settled the argument between the Virginia plan and the New Jersey plan over how to set up the Congress, whether to base Congress uh, on the idea of proportional representation, meaning a represent, represent, representative would be based on the proportion of the population of each state, uh, or should it be based on equal representation? Every state has the same number of representatives. So that was a big compromise, and it cleared the way for a very big decision, which was how to, what kind of Congress uh, the U.S. Constitution would have. Uh, the Articles of Confederation, by the way, had a unicameral Congress, meaning a Congress that was only based on, made up of one house, and it was based on equal representation. So in 
the art under the Articles of Confederation, every state had the same number of representatives, uh, and big states obviously didn't like that because then uh, they tried to get uh, uh, proportional representation into the U.S. Constitution, and you know they succeeded uh, through this great compromise. Another big compromise, the Three Fifths Compromise had to do with slavery, which was a very big issue uh, at the Constitutional Convention. The one thing that southern slaveholding states like Virginia wanted to do at the Constitutional Convention was to protect their right to have slavery. And they succeeded in that. Uh, the uh, Constitution uh, did nothing to set up uh, any plan to abolish slavery either immediately or in the future. And in fact, slavery would exist uh, for uh, nearly 100 years after the uh, ratification of the Constitution uh, until the Civil War ended slavery in 1865. Uh, so the Fifth and Compromise uh, had to do with slavery and particularly uh, how slaves would f be counted for the purpose of deciding how many representatives each state would have in the House of Representatives. Big states which were mostly slave states in the South, like Virginia, wanted slaves to be counted as part of their state's population when it came time to deciding how many representatives the state would have in the House. right? And, and, and that sort of makes sense from their point of view because if you count slaves as part of the population, that increases the population, and then that increases the number of representatives that state would have. Northern states like New Jersey didn't like that idea at all because for the same reason why it was good for southern states, it was bad for northern states. They, Northern states did not want slave states to have even more representatives based on the number of slaves they had. Uh, and their argument against it was that the law that southern states liked did not consider slaves to be citizens of the United States. Uh, in fact, uh, American law didn't even consider slaves to be people. American law considered slaves to be property. And so northern states said, well, if we have a law that considers slaves property and not people, they should not be counted toward the uh, count of population for the purpose of deciding how many representatives a state should have and has the representatives. All right. And so uh, slave states just said, well, you know, we insist that slaves count as people. And if you're not going to agree to that, then we're not going to agree to this constitution. We're not going to be part of this government. And we should just go off and be independent states individually. 13 countries rather than 13 states of one country. And so in the end, uh, northern states and southern states got together and created a compromise, the Three-Fifths Compromise. And what the Three-Fifths Compromise says is that for the purposes of counting population uh, to decide how many representatives a state will have in the House, Slaves will be counted, but not as one person. Slaves would 
instead of being counted as one person, slaves would be counted as three-fifths of a person. So every five slaves would be considered three people for the purpose of deciding how many representatives Virginia would have or other slaveholding states would have. So in the end, uh, the southern states got their way and ended up getting more representation in the House of Representatives because their slaves gave them a higher population count. But it was not as high as it could have been if every slave was considered one whole person rather than three-fifths of a person. And so that three-fifths compromise uh, was uh, another big uh, compromise that led to uh, the eventual agreement to have the Constitution that we have today. Uh, and the fifth compromise uh, no longer uh, exists, obviously, because uh, it uh, became nullified when slavery was abolished in 1865. Okay, so uh, the type of government that the U.S. Constitution created is the type of government we call the Federal Republic. And uh, so if you remember uh, back to what I said uh, during the first lecture, a republic is a form of government where people have the ultimate power of the government, but instead of exercising that power directly by voting on every single law and decision themselves, what they do instead is that they elect people to represent them in the government. They elect uh, mayors, governors, uh, congressmen, the president to represent them. And another important thing that the U.S. Constitution does is it limits the power of the national government by separating power among three branches, the legislative, executive, and judicial branches uh, through the ideas of separation of powers and checks and balances, and by dividing authority between the national government and state governments, uh, which is something we call federalism. So uh, you, you'll remember that I talked about what separation of powers and checks and balances is uh, in the first lecture and how those ideas help to limit the power of the national government uh, and prevent the legislative, executive, and judicial powers from exceeding their authority and abusing the power of the people and the rights of the people. And the second idea, the dividing authority between national government and state governments, is what we call the idea of federalism, uh, and that's something I'm going to talk a lot more about in the next lecture when we get to Chapter 6, which is entirely about uh, how federalism in the United States works. Now, one of the biggest uh, things to know about federalism, and, and we'll talk more about it uh, in the next lecture, is that it gives state governments some exclusive, some exclusive authority. So under the Constitution, under our federalist system, there are certain powers that uh, only the national government has. There are certain powers that only state governments have. And there are certain powers that are shared between the national government and the state governments. So one of the things that state governments have exclusive authority over is the exercise of what we call police powers under the Tenth Amendment. The Tenth Amendment is uh, the uh, last of the Bill of Rights, which spells out the rights of people and states. And what the Tenth Amendment does is say that uh, any powers that are not directly given to the to the national government under our Constitution 
are reserved for the states. Okay? So it's very important because it identifies clearly that there are certain exclusive powers that state governments have. And one of those exclusive powers is what we call the police powers. And police powers are the right to uh, implement laws and policies and rules that are designed to protect the health, safety, and welfare of a state's people. So, for example, uh, one good example of the ability of a state to exercise police powers uh, over its people for the purpose of protecting the people's safety and health and welfare are the types of restrictions that many state governors implemented uh, back in March when the COVID crisis began. So here in New York, for example, one of the first things that Governor Andrew Cuomo did was uh, issue uh, an executive order uh, to limit people's movements and to force many types of businesses to close. And so here in New, here in New York, uh, these were typically known as stay-at-home orders. Uh, so uh, Andrew Cuomo uh, issued an executive order that uh, told people that they should stay home uh, and that they should only leave home in order to conduct essential business like going to the doctor, buying food. Uh, he also issued executive orders requiring people to wear masks in public, which is still the case here in New York City today. Uh, and he also forced many businesses uh, like retail uh, stores, restaurants, uh, to either close completely or, in the case of restaurants, to only be open for the purpose of uh, pickup orders or deliveries. Uh, and uh, we're only now starting to open up again in New York, but still lots of different businesses like hair salons, bar shops, uh, bars are still closed. And so uh, the uh, what gives uh, uh, Governor Andrew Cuomo and the governor governors of other states the right to do this, uh, the right to essentially take people's freedom away from them, is the Tenth Amendment and this idea of police powers, the idea to police people's behavior and police the, uh, the economy uh, in order to protect the health, safety, and welfare of the people against this virus. Right. So the Tenth Amendment is part of the Bill of Rights, which is the first Ten Amendments to the Constitution, which lays out the rights of the people that spells out the rights of the people so remember one of the first one of the three things uh, that the constitution is designed to do is to protect the people's rights and the bill of rights is what does that by spelling out clearly what the rights of the people are uh, for example the right to free speech the right to assembly the right to freedom of religion the right to freedom of the press and also, the Bill of Rights uh, spends a lot of time discussing the rights that we have uh, if we are accused of committing a crime. So you have a right to trial by jury. You have the right to uh, be told uh, what crime you're accused of so that you can defend yourself. Uh, you have the right to a lawyer. Uh, the government cannot put you in jail unless you've been convicted of a crime by a court, by a jury. So all of these things are part of the Bill of Rights. 
Uh, so the purpose of the Bill of Rights is to protect the civil rights of the people. Civil is a Latin word meaning people. And uh, our rights are constantly being interpreted and reinterpreted by the courts, particularly by the Supreme Court. Uh, and we'll talk a lot more about that when we uh, get to the chapter on the court system and the judiciary, and even later on in the semester when I talk about the uh, crime policy and how crime policy is made and how policing works in the United States. Okay, so the last thing uh, that we uh, need to know about the Constitution is that it can be changed. So, uh, and that's one of the great things about the Constitution. Uh, we've had the Constitution since 1788, and one of the reasons why we've had it for so long, why it's worked for so long, is that it can be changed over time if we need to adapt uh, we can adapt to new circumstances because we can change the Constitution. Uh, and the fact that we've had the same Constitution since 1788 is quite remarkable. Uh, the United States is uh, a fairly new country in the world. Uh, we, we've only existed since 1783 when the American Revolution ended. That's a lot younger than a lot of other countries in the world the countries like Great Britain, France, Russia, China are much, much older than the United States. But these countries have had several different types of government, several constitutions since 1788. We've had just the one since 1788. And the reason for that is because the constitution can be changed uh, and to ch uh, changes to the Constitution are called amendments. Uh, it's not easy to change the Constitution, but you can change it. Uh, it's, uh, in fact, very difficult to amend the Constitution. Uh, to do that is a two-step process. There are two uh, institutions that are involved in changing the Constitution. One is Congress. And the other is the states. The president is not part of the equation uh, when it comes to changing the Constitution. Uh, many people think that the president is involved in creating an amendment. No, it's just Congress and the states. So the first uh, part of changing the Constitution uh, requires Congress to actually create an amendment and to uh, formally propose it. And to formally propose a constitution, uh, Congress needs to pass that proposal by two-thirds vote in both houses. So, uh, for example, in the Senate, where there are 100 senators today, 50 states, each, each uh, state has two senators, there are 100 senators, 67 senators have to agree to a proposal for an amendment in order for the proposal to be passed. So that's quite a lot. In the House of Representatives today, there are 435 members. So that means 292 of the 435 need to uh, approve the proposal for the uh Congress to approve the uh, proposed amendment. Uh, and, and in both chambers, that needs to happen. So 67 senators have to agree and 292 uh, members of the House of Representatives. And even if that, after that happens, that's only the first of two steps. That's only half the, uh, that's only half the process. The other half of the process is that the amendment has to be accepted by the states. And it has to be accepted by uh, three quarters of the states. Three quarters of 50 states is 34. So 34 of 50 states have to agree after Congress agrees. Uh, so how does the state agree to it? Well, so here in New York, for example, if we were to be asked to vote an amendment, New York State would have a vote. 
everyone who is eligible to vote in New York State would go to the polls and you would be asked, yes or no, do you accept this amendment? If you agree with the amendment, you'd vote yes. If you don't, you agree, you'd vote no. If more people vote yes in New York, New York accepts the amendment. If more people vote no, New York does not accept the amendment. So each of the 50 states would have that kind of a vote. If 34 states agree, then the amendment is added to the Constitution. If 34 states don't agree, then the amendment is not added to the Constitution. And remember, states can't vote until Congress writes and agrees to the amendment. So that's a very difficult, long process. Uh, doesn't happen very often, but it can happen. In fact, there have only been 27 amendments to the Constitution. Uh, one of the amendments, uh, one of the most important amendments to the Constitution uh, in uh, recent uh, history is the, con the amendment that uh, set the age of 18 as the minimum age of voting in the United States. Uh, the original text of the Constitution that was passed in 1787 doesn't set a minimum age for voting. In fact, it doesn't say very much about who can and who is not allowed to vote in the United States. And so in the 1970s, an amendment was added to the Constitution to set the age of 18 as the minimum vote because at that time, most states did not allow you to vote until you reached the age of 21. And uh, many people thought that was unfair, especially younger people, because at the time, 18-year-olds uh, could be drafted into the military. And 18-year-olds in the 1970s were off fighting the Vietnam War. And so young people said, well, if it's okay, if 18-year-olds are old enough to go into the military and fight and die for their country, they should also have the right to vote for the representatives who are going to make the decision to send them off to war. And so based on that argument, the Congress and the states uh, created an amendment that was added to the Constitution that set the age of 18 as the minimum age uh, for voting in the United States. So uh, those uh, uh, all those amendments uh, were added to the Constitution in this way, uh, 27 of them. And, and if you Google the Constitution, look up the Constitution on the Internet, you can go through all the amendments if you're interested in seeing what kind of amendments have been passed uh, over time uh, since... Uh, since uh, the uh, the Bill of Rights was added, uh, the first ten amendments were added right after the Constitution was drafted in uh, 1787. So that's the end of this lecture. Uh, I hope that uh, you got something out of this.